to give you one more round of applause to all of our musicians on Gospel Music Sunday. We're thankful for you. Thankful for you to be together uh, this morning as we gather here. I want to remind you, some people are not here this morning. Uh, Dr. Christy Robbins, one of our associate pastors on vacation, keep her in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Jim Love, pastor of our River Oaks community, that is our daughter congregation working on the River Oaks side of town. So I want to remind you, don't forget about that open house, that uh, come and see time on June the 12th, Saturday, June the 12th from 11 to 1 uh, in the morning, 11, starting at 11 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock. Uh, we're just going to show you what's happening on the River Oaks campus. It's a part of who we are, and we're able to work with them together to do something wonderful over there. So I hope you'll come out and see what's happening at our daughter congregation over on the River Oaks part of town, River Oaks United Methodist Church. Come and see on Saturday, June the 12th from 11 to 1. We're going to have a lot of fun over there. You're going to see some amazing ministries that you're helping to make happen. Let's turn our attention now to the gospel as it comes to us from Luke chapter 9, beginning in the 57th verse. Listen for God's holy word. As Jesus and his disciples traveled along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and The birds in the sky have nests, but the human one or the son of man has no place to lay his head. Then Jesus said to someone else, follow me. He replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of God's kingdom. Someone else said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those in my house. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Eternal God, may your word be our word, and your ways be our ways. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Usually when I think of a brownie, I think of the chocolate kind. Anybody out there with me? But this morning, I have a different brownie for you. One more vintage camera from my collection of old but not particularly valuable cameras. This is my 1946 Kodak brownie. More specifically, it's a brownie Target 620. Kodak created the brownie box camera, and you can see it's a box. Kodak created the brownie box camera all the way back in 1900 as a way to offer photography to the masses at a time when taking pictures was done mostly by professionals for one dollar. One dollar. In 1900, for one dollar, the average consumer could now take their own snapshots using one of these very simple devices. It came preloaded with film, it gave you eight shots, and although the camera received a variety of improvements over its very long product run, this basic box design didn't change much for over 50 years. This camera although it's just a box, was revolutionary in American photography because this camera bought photography to the masses. And it did one more thing. The Kodak Brownie gave rise to what would be one of the most prolific advertising campaigns in American history. It created what we've come to know as the Kodak Moment. Anybody ever have a Kodak moment? 
A Kodak moment is a moment in time that is so precious because of its sentimental value or because of its beauty that one wishes to preserve it on film. A baby's first steps, a couple's first dance at a wedding, a view of the sweeping vista of the Grand Canyon or the Grand Tetons, as Pastor Christie might be experiencing them this morning. Those are all Kodak moments. In this magazine ad for a Kodak Brownie Star Flash camera from 61 years ago this month in May, a mom is taking a picture of a baby being cute, and the tagline reads, Moments like this won't wait for dad. I assume dad is off working while mom's home taking pictures of a cute kid. It's 1960 in this picture. But the idea of the Kodak moment outlived even the Kodak camera business itself. There may not be Kodak cameras like there were before, but there are still Kodak moments. I had one just the other day. I was exiting from eastbound I-20 onto Hewland Street. It was early in the morning, very little traffic on the road. Maybe that's why the other vehicle stood out to me. Or maybe the reason that other vehicle stood out to me was that it was an ice cream truck. Now, I don't recommend taking pictures from the car while driving. Don't do that. This picture was actually taken by a dash cam, which allows you to safely take pictures while you drive. I have one of those so that I can bore you with pictures of my driving vacation later this summer. That's another story. The Bluebell truck is ahead of me. I'm in the center lane. Bluebell ice cream is in the right lane. And I have a choice to make. Do I get in the right lane and follow the Bluebell truck? Knowing that wherever that truck is going, sweet, fresh Bluebell ice cream is about to be delivered. Or do I get in the left lane so that I can go to work? It's a tough choice, isn't it? The photograph shows an image of the road, but it can't tell you anything about the road ahead. From Luke chapter 9, back in verse 57, in my Bible, the subheading says the cost of following Jesus. As Jesus and his disciples traveled along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then Jesus said to someone else, follow me. And he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and spread the news of God's kingdom. Someone else said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those who are in my house. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. Luke chapter 9 is a very busy chapter. It starts out with a story about the commissioning of the disciples, sending them out to go to work and sending them out with very specific instructions. Then we get a story about Jesus' identity, another story about Jesus feeding 5,000 people, Then there's a story about Jesus predicting his own suffering. Then we have the magnificent transfiguration story. Jesus, Elijah, and Moses all up on a mountain. After that, Jesus heals a possessed child. It's a very busy chapter. But around verse 51 of chapter 9, the trajectory 
of chapter 9 and of Luke's gospel as a whole changes. You see, Luke has largely followed Mark's outline up to this point. Mark mostly focuses on Jesus' ministry in Galilee and Jesus' passion and crucifixion and resurrection in Jerusalem with a relatively short section in between that describes Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And it's right here in chapter 9 where Luke departs from following Mark's outline and instead begins to add a great deal of his own original material, things you'll only find in Luke. We often refer to this as Luke's travel narrative. And one of the first things, one of the first things Luke shares with us in his extensive nine-chapter travel narrative is the cost of traveling itself, the cost of following Jesus. Three quick scenes that emphasize the radical nature of Christian discipleship. Someone says to Jesus, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus responds, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. Jesus is homeless. It's a Christological claim. Jesus is the Christ and yet, he is a rejected wanderer. And the question is, will those who claim a willingness to follow Jesus, will they be willing to follow him there? The second story. Jesus says to a different person, a second person, follow me. And the man replies, okay, but first, let me go home and bury my father. We assume that Jesus, being understanding, will make an appropriate accommodation for this man who has just experienced this loss. But Jesus doesn't. Instead, Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. I've got other things for you to do. You're to go and spread the good news of God's kingdom. Respect for parents and respect for the burial of the dead were very sacred obligations in Jewish tradition. And yet Jesus makes this shocking demand of a person who's just lost his father. Which is the point. This saying is intended to shock, intended to portray the radical nature of Christian discipleship in the most provocative way possible. Because following Jesus is not like joining a book club or a Facebook group or even a church. Following Jesus requires a radical reprioritization of your way of life. The third story. A third person says to Jesus, okay, I'm in. I'm right with you. Just let me say a quick goodbye to my family back home, and then I'll be right with you. And Jesus says, you're not listening. You're not listening. Verse 62, Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. It's a little reminiscent of the story of Elijah calling Elisha, if you remember that story from 1 Kings. But in that story, Elijah does not object 
when Elisha asks if he can go home and kiss his mom and dad goodbye before following Elijah. Elijah doesn't object, but Jesus does. And then Jesus has this whole discussion about fitness. No one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's be sure we understand fit. You see, I don't think fit means worthy. Those who look back are not worthy of God's kingdom. I think Luke's meaning here is more practical. Fit means capable, suitable, able. Those who look back will simply be unable to enter God's kingdom. Think about plowing. Any farmers here? Not a single farmer in this whole, there's a farmer out there. Hello, farmer. How are you? I'm glad to see you. Have you ever done any plowing? You've plowed a little bit. Farmers plow. Think about plowing this morning. No one who puts a hand to the plow like Farmer David and looks back is capable of God's kingdom. Have you plowed before? What happens when you plow while looking backward? You plow crooked. That's what happens. You can't plow in a nice straight line, keeping all the rows, all the furrows, they call them, intact while looking backward. That's impossible. One who plows and looks back will inevitably plow a crooked furrow. Following Jesus requires focus on the goal ahead. Which brings us back to the problem with pictures, photographs like the one I showed you before. You see, a picture is a snapshot in time, an image we have of that Kodak moment, a moment that because of beauty or because of sentimentality, we sought to preserve in a picture. Where do a lot of Kodak moments take place? Right here. Church. Church is a place where lots of Kodak moments happen. Baptisms, Easter mornings, Christmases together. Church produces lots and lots of Kodak moments. And those moments are to be savored and treasured and held close. But following Jesus requires focus on the goal ahead. That's the first big thing Luke wants us to know as he begins his extensive travel narrative. He wants us to know how to travel. You can't plow a crooked furrow unless you're looking backward. You can't plow a straight forward while you're looking backward. You'll plow a crooked line every time. And you can't move forward either in your personal discipleship or with the church's mission as a whole, you can't move forward when your primary orientation is looking backward. It just doesn't work. Following Jesus requires focus on the goal ahead. Too often, we fall in love with an image. The sentimentality of that Kodak moment we were just talking about. We've got a picture in our head of what we think things ought to look like. And we spend so much time trying to relive that past moment that we lose our focus on what's next. Traveling with Jesus requires a focus on the road ahead. Becoming a post-COVID church, the most church we can possibly be, requires a focus on what's 
ahead. Which scripture tells us is better and wiser anyway. From Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning with the 8th verse, we heard it moments ago. The end, the preacher from Ecclesiastes says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. And patience is better than pride. Verse 10, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Why not? Why isn't it wise to ask that question? Boy, the old days sure were better than they were today, weren't they? Why does Scripture warn us, tell us that it is unwise to ask that? Because asking that question tempts us to live in the past, to try to recreate past conditions, relive past moments, revive past images of things we've seen and loved, rather then move forward. The end is better than the beginning. And achieving that end requires a future orientation. Not a nostalgic attachment to the past. And that doesn't mean that we abandon everything that got us to this point. Far from it. We need that perspective. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. And if you take it upon yourself to visit any local cemetery, you'll see the flags. They're reminders of those who lost their lives in military service to our nation. Remembering their sacrifice is what tomorrow is all about. But we don't stay in the cemetery. We remember, we honor, and then we go. Go forward to live out the freedom those brave people gave their lives to provide. We need perspective to know where we've been, to know where we are, but then we need to focus forward. It is unwise, as Ecclesiastes says, to ask this question. Weren't things way better back in the day? Wisdom requires a different orientation. From the wisdom of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5, it was our call to worship this morning. Did you hear it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, the wisdom of Proverbs says, and do not lean on your own understanding, relying on images of the past, pictures we have in our mind of how things used to be before COVID, before the polarization of our culture, before whatever, relying on those static moments in time to guide us into the future is to lean on our own understanding. Faith makes a path for a new future. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Allow God to give us a better view of what's ahead than we could ever glean from a snapshot in time. What does post-COVID church look like? Not exactly the same, but still Christ-filled. As the situation continues to improve, I suspect more and more people will come back. But some have found a way to connect to their faith community 
while staying home, watching our live stream. They're going to continue to do that. Bless them. How shall we minister well to them? And even more importantly, as we turn our attention to reaching people we've never reached before, introducing Christ to people who've never known Christ before, some of our past techniques and strategies and ministries may still be effective, but in a world that has now shifted significantly in terms of how people connect with others, whether it's how they shop or how they're educated or how they go to work every single day, in a world that has shifted how we reach new people for Christ might need to shift as well. That requires a forward focus. That requires us as the body of Christ to orient ourselves to the road ahead. I never told you which direction I turned. The picture of me behind the Bluebell truck as I approached Hewlin Street, the Bluebell truck in the right lane, to get to work I needed to be in the left lane. What did I do? You might have guessed what I did, but just relying on the picture, you can't tell. You see a picture, an image, whether it's an image on a screen or an image in your memory, can only show you that static past moment in time. But it can't help you with what's next. That picture is of the road but it can tell you nothing about decisions made for the road ahead. Which is the problem with relying too much on pictures, isn't it? Let us pray together. Lord God, May we lean not on our own understanding, but lean even more heavily on you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.